to invite you all to stand as we praise God in song. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you lead. this morning. Next Sunday is our big cookout, our first area church, area-wide fellowship since the pandemic. Now, because the church is providing the hamburgers and the hot dogs, we need you to sign up in the uh, member center or in the lobby so we'll know how much to buy and then also sign up to bring a side dish or dessert. It's going to be a great, great Sunday next Sunday to have that fellowship together. Hey, our ladies' Bible class on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock is beginning in the month of May, a new study on the book of Hosea, and then that class will dismiss for the summer. So if you're interested in that five-week study of the book of Hosea, ladies, 
make plans to be there Tuesdays at 10 a.m. And finally, our church supports South Strand Helping Hand as we seek to feed the hungry in our local community. We do so with monetary donations as well as with physical contributions. Uh, the items in need for the month of May are personal items like shampoo, soap, etc. There's a box in the member center if you want to bring any of those items in, place them there, and they will get the South Strand Helping Hand. All right, it's been a while since we've done our memory verse check. From Romans 12, verse 10, I do hope you still have it memorized, right? All right, say it out loud with me. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another before yourselves. That's how we're doing together in 2022. Let's continue to worship in song. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the serve you. 
I wait for the Lord with my whole being, waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us today to gather together to sing songs of worship and praise to you, Lord. We are so grateful and thankful for the mercy and grace that you show us each and every day, Lord. We know we're not worthy and we can't earn it, Lord, but we're so thankful for this grace that you've given us. We know that you, Lord, are the one who forgives sins and through your son, Jesus Christ, give us an opportunity to have access to you. We ask that you be with us now, be with Jay, open our hearts and open our ears to listen to your word. We ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Jesus said his father was always at his work. And as a minister of a church, I get to see uh, the father at work in individual lives. And I like to share them with you from time to time because I believe that as we share our story of God's work in our lives, it helps out each other. And this morning, I've asked Mike McGill to join me on stage to talk about uh, a story in his life uh, and God's work in it that I'm hoping will help uh, someone here this morning. Mike, back in 2012, you were the director of a mental health education center for at-risk kids. When you began to suffer from depression yourself, so tell us what some of your symptoms were. Um. It, it, the director was a very complex job. I had to work with seven superintendents and seven school districts. And uh, I'd done it for a while and was able to get along with the seven little kings in their kingdom, which is what I call them. Um, but we, had, we ran a pretty good tight ship. And uh, in 2012, before school was opening, there were some things going on. And it started bothering me a little bit. And as things kept going, I found that I was starting not able to sleep well. Mm -hmm. I'd do like an all-around watch at night. I saw 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and things kept going through my mind instead of just, you know, going to sleep. After that, I noticed, you know, I was going to work, and I never had problems making decisions. And things would come up, and I was like, I, I don't know what to do. Kind, kind of like, how, how do I handle this? When before, I would just step up, and my team kind of covered for me. and. Uh, it got to where I had sleep deprivation. I didn't get sleep at all, and my wife had to go get me some um, medication, sleep aids, just to go. She had to beg. If you don't understand, you can't go to sleep. Nothing like sleep deprivation. And I found that the things that I enjoyed, I didn't enjoy anymore. I could always go on the golf course and play and forget everything. I, I couldn't even do that. And I was indecisive. I became a little bit angry what's going on, and it just kept getting worse and worse. I, I, I wouldn't do anything all day. I'd, I'd go to work, do what I could there, come back and just lay down, didn't watch TV, didn't do anything. So you were experiencing do. several of the common symptoms of depression. Exactly. And in one way, it made no sense to you, right, that you were depressed, even though work was a little more stressful. Right. Still, it made no sense because why? I had everything I could ask for. God bless me. I have a wonderful wife. I've got a job that I was able to progress all the way up to for. Our house was paid off. I couldn't get where it was coming. Yeah, why were you depressed since so much of your life was good? And during this time, uh, your faith in God and your expertise in the mental health field, um, did it make you immune from mental illness? And that puts you in a crisis of faith, not only in God, uh, but in yourself. How so? I, I, as you said, I was in mental health. I was, a, you know, I've got a uh, degree in counseling, and I've worked with a lot of depressed people. But until it hits you, you don't understand how debilitating it can be. No energy, and I thought, what is wrong with me? I even start saying, God, where are you at in this picture? And in Philippians it says, um, be not anxious, but in everything, with prayer and supplications of thanksgiving, go to God. And I did that. And, and still I was struggling. And, you know, throughout the Bible it says, you know, that we shouldn't worry. 
easy to say, mm -hmm. not easy to do. And I was mad at myself for not being strong enough to, to share over this. And as a mental health professional, it sure opened my eyes as to what depression really is. Well, I consider myself a pretty strong person. And, and how does the help finally arrive? In what ways did God provide you with the help that you needed? Well, through a couple of things. One of them, my wife, she mentioned to the doctor that I had I, I had to go in for uh, chest pain. They thought I had a heart problem. Well, it turned out they had to do the, oh, what, the cardio? I can't remember. Anyway, it showed a shadow, so I had to go and get everything done. And it came out all right. But, so that kind of bothered me. My wife said, he's kind of on edge. This is at the very beginning of it. This lasted two to three months. And uh, after a while, I said, yeah. He said, there's all kinds of stuff. He says, I take an antidepressant. Now, this is my doctor. And uh, I said, well, okay, I would have done anything at that point. And uh, he gave me some medication. And you have to stay on it a little bit. And he kind of raised it up a little bit. And finally, I started to, to get better. And this is one of the things that I wanted you to walk away with. If, if you're here this morning and struggling with depression, as you pray to God and reach out to help from God, uh, consider going to see your doctor. There's nothing unscriptural or uh, unfaithful about taking medication as well for mental illness. And Mike, I'm just uh, grateful that God provided you with what you needed during this dark period in your life and grateful that you've been willing to share with the church this morning. Would you, uh, church, thank Mike for sharing with you. Thank you.
One of the blessings uh, for me in this life has been the ability to see. Uh, I love color. I love brightness. And uh, this spring has just kind of been sensory overload with the azaleas here in town, the dogwoods. Uh, but the real tragedy in life is not so much being blind and not being able to see at all. It's having the ability to see, but not really see what's going on. And there's a story in John chapter 1 when uh, John's out preaching and, and the, uh, the leaders, spiritual leaders, send people to him and say, who are you? And he says, well, I'm not the Christ. Well, are you Elijah? I'm not Elijah. Are, are you the prophet? No, I'm not the prophet. And then he goes on to say, you guys are focusing on me when the one you really need to focus on is standing right before you. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Spirit. And then we have this, this uh, story, this uh, teaching in John chapter 1, starting with verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then John says, I have seen and I testify, testify that this is the Son of God. Today when we take communion, what we in fact are saying is that we see and we testify that this is the Lamb of God who came to set the world free from sin. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we, uh, we bow before you today, acknowledging that even though we can see with our eyes, many times we don't see with our heart, with our being. But Father, we want to say to you this morning, we see Jesus. We know that he is the Savior of the world. We know that he is the Holy One from you. And we acknowledge today by taking this bread and drinking of this cup. We just, we know how much that sacrifice means to us. And so as we, we take of the bread today that represents the broken body of Jesus, Help us not just see a man on the cross, but see a Savior who walks with us every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pray with me again. Father, we sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we realize today 
that it's through his blood that we have the remission of our sins. Father, my prayer today is that we don't just see and recognize the power that's in that blood on Sundays when we take this cup, but that we live that way every day. Father, thank you for sending your Son. Jesus, thank you for your willingness to give all for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. stand and sing one more song and during the singing of this song young people you're dismissed to go to your Bible hour and we prepare for hours. All to us.
has your, your church fared during the pandemic? So a lot of things uh, have changed uh, since the pandemic. Uh, the workforce, for instance. Prior to the pandemic, one in 67 jobs uh, were remote. Today it's one in seven. It's a huge, huge shift in the labor force. And certainly uh, churches have changed uh, since the pandemic as well. Now when he asked the question, I hadn't read this article. Uh, it was titled, Most Comprehensive Study Yet of COVID's Impact on Churches Finds Uneven Results. So overall, churches declined in attendance in America about 12%. The only churches in America that fared okay during the pandemic are those who went hybrid, right? Those who had uh, in-person as well as uh, on uh, computer options. Churches that did one or the other uh, did not do well at all in terms of connection and attendance during the pandemic. Uh, but the consensus overall uh, is that the pandemic simply accelerated what was happening in American churches pre-pandemic. Uh, quote, the once in a century pandemic that began in late 2019 put a whole lot of congregations on life support. Many will never recover. Weekly attendance for most congregations will never return to pre-pandemic numbers. You know what our magic number is, by the way? Like pre-pandemic that we're looking at to see how we fared since pandemic. 239 pre-pandemic was our average attendance on Sunday morning. So when you get your e-bulletin and you look at the data, uh, think 239 and compare it to what you're seeing uh, week to week in our church. Now, back in 2019, our church got real about the state of decline in churches in America. And so our theme that year, do you remember 2019? It was get younger in 2019 because churches in America are getting older and older and older and consequently they are dying. So we decided to no longer stick our heads in the sand and that we would from that time on uh, invest time, energy, and resources in helping our church uh, to get younger by virtue of making disciples of the younger generation. Now, here are some sad facts about Churches of Christ in America today. And, and Churches of Christ aren't uh, unique in, in their decline. Pretty much every Christian fellowship in America is in a state of decline. But in terms of Churches of Christ, uh, while we are the 13th largest Christian fellowship in America, uh, ever since 1990, Churches of Christ have been in decline. And uh, five states have a um, little more than half of all members of Churches of Christ in them. You could probably name those five states, right? Tennessee and Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So over half of members of Churches of Christ can be found in just five states in our country. Now, over half of the congregations in America, Churches of Christ, average only 34 members. 92% of Churches of Christ in America have less than 200 members. And around 60 Churches of Christ a year are closing their doors for good in America. And so based on uh, projections from years past, as you project that slide, uh, in the future, uh, what was 12,200 and something Churches of Christ in America in 2016 will be about uh, 2,800 Churches of Christ in America in 2050. We'll go from 1.1 million members in 2016 to a quarter of a million members in 2050 if things continue at the pace and rate they have for a good while now. Now, I know... And you know that, that numbers don't tell uh, the whole story uh, about the health of a church. But, but numbers, like in any other field, can sort of predict a trend and a future. And our church needs to stay focused on, on what that trend is. Uh, someone wrote, if we don't know a church is dying, we won't look for courage because we won't know we need it. 
We will waste time on piddling matters like a, a dying man haggling over a price of a new suit and miss the chance to do things that might actually matter. And church matters. And we live at a time where people claim to love Jesus but could care less about the church. And so if you ever meet someone like that pass on these four, four fast facts about Jesus and the church to hopefully change their minds. Number one, Jesus built the church based on Peter's confession. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus is in the church building business. And if you claim to love Jesus, you must be about the work that Jesus is about, right? which is building churches. Fast fact number two, Jesus died for the church. The Apostle Paul told the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts 20, verse 28, be shepherds of the church of God, which Jesus bought with his own blood. Fast fact number three, Jesus employs the church. Ephesians 1, and 23 says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church, which is Jesus' body. Now, add on Ephesians 3, verse 10, which says, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the world. The church's role is to share the wisdom of God with the rest of the world. Jesus employs the church. He's in charge of the church, and every Christian is called to work for Jesus in the ministry of building the church. And then finally, fast fact number four, Jesus monitors every church. Revelation 2 and 3 records seven different messages Jesus had for seven different churches in Asia Minor in the first century. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus is monitoring every single church. He cares about the church universally, and he cares about the church locally. And we need to understand that Jesus is monitoring our church as well. So based on these four fast facts, it's hard to imagine someone who could love Jesus and care less about the church that Jesus is building. Does that make sense? And just one goes hand in hand with the other. There's no such thing as an unchurched Christian in the New Testament, and there isn't meant to be one in 2022 as well. And so we need to care deeply about the church right here as well as the church around the world. Also based on these four fast facts about Jesus and the church, it seemingly would be impossible to be someone who loves Jesus and not be concerned about the future of the church based on the numbers and based on the projections. Now, if, if you haven't been concerned about not just the present church, but the future church, I'm hoping the Holy Spirit will awaken your heart uh, to what's happening and, and what Jesus uh, is deeply concerned about. Someone wrote, anyone who isn't concerned about the future church is like a man surrounded by a raging wildfire who shuts himself in his house, pours himself a glass of ice-cold tea, and reaches for the remote control. Talk about indifference. Everything's burning around you. And you're acting like it isn't. The church is declining all around us and many Christians are acting like it isn't. But it is. And indifference. Indifference is going to lead the future decline and erosion of the church. And so this morning I'm going to take you to Revelation chapter 3. And we will study Jesus' seventh message to that seventh church. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3 and in hopes of awaking any of us who have been indifferent or apathetic out of that. Now, 
Before we read these familiar words to some of you, um, for these words to come alive in their fullness, you need to have some, some background on the area and the situation. So don't start reading just yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you up with some background to help Jesus' words really come alive to you, okay? So this seventh message is to the church at Laodicea. And in the first century, this city had a lot going on for it. But one thing it did not have going for it was a water supply. And so they got their water from the city of Hierapolis, about six or seven miles away, uh, through an aqueduct that, that came in the Laodicea. Now, Hierapolis was built around a number of uh, hot springs. And so the water that started there as hot came through the aqueduct, and by the time it reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Now, we find a lot of good uses for hot water, a lot of good uses for cold water, but very seldom we find a good use for lukewarm water. So first thing, just put it in your mind, water supply, lukewarm water. Number two, uh, this city had all the trimmings of a boom town in the Roman period in the first century. It had a stadium, it had a theater, giant bathhouses, uh, the textile industry uh, fueled the economy. Uh, their three chief exports from Laodicea were gold, wool, and eye salve. There's actually a medical school in Laodicea uh, that manufactured this, this eye medication. And so put it in your mind, there are three chief exports, okay? Gold, wool for clothing, and eye salve. By the way, there was also a serious banking industry here because it was just so filled with money. And then finally, you need to know that Laodicea was a fiercely independent city and people. Uh, we know there was a major earthquake in the year 60 that devastated their city. The Roman uh, emperor offered to send them government subsidies and uh, stimulus packages to help them rebuild their city, and the city leaders said, no, we got it. We'll pay the bill ourselves. So you get their sense of independence and self-sufficiency. Okay, you got those three things in your head? Water, chief exports, uh, self-sufficiency. Now listen to what Jesus says to them. Revelation 3, verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. All right, you ready in verse 18 for the three chief exports? Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This is the only church of those seven that Jesus has nothing positive to say about. It is all negative, bad news for the church at Laodicea. And it all hinges around this word lukewarm. I can do something with cold, I can do something with hot. Wish you were one or the other. But lukewarm just makes me sick to my stomach. Now, my wife and I bought a, a new car last fall for her. And um, when our daughter came home from college, we took her on her first spin in the new car. And I'm driving and dying is uh, telling Liz about the buying process. If you don't know, you bought a, if you haven't bought a car like in the last six months, it's different than any other car buying experience 
you have ever had. You know how people are outbidding people for houses? That's, that's happening for cars as well. And so Dinah's telling Liz about this experience, and I'm just listening, and, and Dinah says, you know, we almost had the red one. We thought we had the red one, but the deal got done quicker with the guy uh, down the hall. So we lost the red one, and we had to buy this one, the silver one. And Dinah said to Liz, silver? Eh, eh, but I'll live. spent all this money on a new car and it's an eh? I mean, that's what this is. It's an eh? And eh, I, can, I can live with it. Indifference, right? And that's what the church at Laodicea is about Jesus. Eh. Just, just indifferent about Jesus. And that was turning Jesus' stomach over. So underneath their difference, indifference, if you listen closely, um, lay a smug self-sufficiency. And wealth can do that to a person. That's why Jesus said in the Gospels, it'll be really hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Because rich people are self-sufficient in many ways. And the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to confess that you are deficient. That you're spiritually bankrupt. You are deep in need. And this church has lost their sense of deficiency and now believe that they are self-sufficient. Jesus said, I know what you say. He said, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and don't need a thing. Translation in our times, I got this. I got this. I got this. I got this. A sort of self-sufficiency. Now, something happened to them that could happen to us. They were now being shaped by their culture instead of being shaped by Jesus. And it was happening without them realizing it. it. It can happen to us without us realizing it as well. So how does this happen? How can you tell if it's happening to you? Well, here are just a few ideas. You start quoting your favorite actors and athletes more than you quote Jesus. You're like more well-versed in their words than you are in Jesus' words. Now you're being shaped by your culture. Or you do a deep dive into social media for hours and hours and hours and, and never open up and read the words of Jesus. Like it or not, you are being shaped by your culture rather than being shaped by Jesus. And when the world's values and philosophies begin to make more sense to you than Jesus' values and philosophies, you are most assuredly being shaped by the culture instead of being shaped by Jesus. Now, now we like to tell parents, look, if you don't disciple your kids, the world will. And that's true, but it's true of all of us of any age. If we aren't being discipled by Jesus, the world is discipling us, and like the church at Laodicea, uh, we lose sight of what's really happening in us. Now, that's one of the real scary things about Jesus' message to the church. I mean, the contrast, did you notice them, are shocking. The contrast between what they think they are as a church and what Jesus knows they are as a church. Two different stories. And then there's this contrast between what they see and what Jesus sees. Two different stories. And then there's this contrast between wealth and self-efficiency and uh, spiritual bankruptcy. And they are blissfully ignorant. They think everything in church is great until Jesus gives them this reality check and he counsels them to what? Did you read it? Buy from me. And those three chief exports, you need to buy your gold from me, you need to buy your clothes from me, you need to buy your eye salve from me. What is that telling you? It's telling you that they have stopped importing Jesus and his life and values into their lives. But selling all this stuff, export, 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 and they aren't importing, importing, importing. Jesus and his values and truths. 
And that's why Jesus says, I know your deeds. They had become a church who was acting like they didn't need Jesus anymore. Now we got to make sure that never happens here, right? To us individually and to us collectively. And as we still like labor to like stem the tide of decline in the church, right? That was 2019, but that's still one of my core values in 2022. Getting younger, right? How to build not just for the present church today, but for the future church long after you and I are gone. And, and what I've realized is, this is the bad news. We don't have the answers. Uh, it is not within us to stem this tide. In other words, we're not the solution. But here's the good news. We've never been the solution. Jesus, right, is the solution. We're called to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and simply follow him. And I think that's our solution as we seek to get younger, right, and build for the future. It is to do that really well and let Jesus take care of the rest. We deny ourselves, we take up our crosses, and we follow. It's the story throughout Scripture of death, burial, and resurrection. That is the good news, right? Death, burial, and resurrection. And so we must always seek a place of death so that Jesus can resurrect and build new life in the church. And so as we try to do this, um, there are just four things I want to remind you of uh, that I think are essential to us being a church that's always the right temperature. Okay, Never lukewarm. Here's number one. We must believe that we need Jesus all of the time. That's got to be deep down in the pit of our souls. We live that truth out. We believe we need Jesus all of the time. Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You hear him teaching you? You can't do anything. That's worth doing over the long haul without Jesus being at the center of it. And so there are signs that we are doing this or not doing this. Believing we need Jesus all of the time. I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few. If, if our lives are absent of prayer, for the most part, we stop believing we need Jesus all the time. If our lives are absent of his word, uh, we've started to believe that we don't need Jesus all of the time. We got it. If, if our every day isn't about worshiping Jesus, getting up every morning and saying these words. If you don't say them, I would encourage you to say them when you get out of bed. Jesus, I can't do this day without you being at the center of it. Jesus, I need you in everything that I experience today. Now you start saying that, that's a reminder that you need Jesus all of the time. There's not room for you to go solo in any part of your day and depend on your skills and your abilities and your past. You need Jesus all the time. Now, when we studied Ephesians 5 recently, uh, there are three things also that suggest uh, we believe we need Jesus all of the time. If you're filled with the Spirit, uh, what happens? you got a song in your heart. You sing to God and others. You give thanks regularly, and you submit to others on a regular basis. Those are three things that tell you, as you look at your life, if you believe you need Jesus all the time. Because if you do, you've got the song in this heart. That you're sharing, and daily you are expressing gratitude to Jesus. You're not taking credit for your dinner, right? Thanking Jesus. You're not taking credit for getting through your day without really hurting someone. You give praise to Jesus and thanks to Jesus, and you are through your day like giving in and submitting to someone else, right? Instead of demanding your way. That's a sign you believe you need Jesus 
all of the time. So number one, we need to believe we need Jesus all the time. Number two, we seek to be biblical all of the time. Yeah, depending on who you are. Some things about us look a little traditional. Some things about us look a little contemporary. But all things about us must be biblical. Honoring God and His Word. Anything that we do, any decision that we make, must first go through the filter of what does the Bible say? That's always the first thing in our church. What is honoring of Scripture? And if it's not, we cannot do it. God's Word comes first. So I was reading about one of these church consultants that travels and works with churches in America that are on the decline. And this was his observation. When I talk to church members and church leaders, fear is often the most tangible emotion on display. They are afraid to upset anyone. Afraid of pushing outsiders away. Afraid to make a decision. Afraid not to make a decision. Afraid they will change. Afraid they won't change. And man, I'm familiar with those fears. Because I hate disappointing anyone. And there are times when we make decisions in our church that I know this is going to disappoint this person or maybe that person. But that fear is no longer my God. I used to worship that idol. Let's just keep everybody happy. But no, the one thing that conquers that fear is belief in God's word and honoring it first before anyone else. And then number three, we need to be loving all the time. Believing in Jesus all the time, that we need him all the time. Honoring God's word all the time and loving all the time. I know I'm wrong about things. I do not live with this confidence of, I believe I've interpreted everything in the Bible perfectly. I know I am wrong about things, and I've learned how to live with that, that my limitations that I have as a human being. I just think the wrong way sometimes, make the wrong decisions sometimes. But what I can't live with in my life and what you can't live with in your life is the failure to be loving all the time. People can insult you. They can withdraw from you. They can talk about you to others. But in return, you and I must love that person all of the time. Refuse to speak a negative word about that person to others all of the time. And continue to pour love in to that person or those people all of the time. If there's one thing that cannot be tolerated in the church, it is the failure to love others all of the time. We can tolerate disagreements with each other. That's normal family life. But we can't tolerate the failure to love each other through all of that. And then finally, we must make disciples all of the time. Everything that we're about right now, this 45 minutes we're giving all of our kids... It is all about making disciples of Jesus in them for those 45 minutes. And pretty much everything we're seeking to do as a church filters back into how do we build each other up as disciples? How do we make others disciples of Jesus Christ? And so we want to do that for all generations. But again, as a church, back in 2019, we decided that we were going to pour in extra resources time and energy into making disciples of younger people, and we're still committed to do that. Well, I know a lot of you have kids and grandkids that don't go to church anymore. You raise them in the church, right? And then at age 18, they disappeared from the church, and I know that breaks your heart. And so people have, people have studied this, and... Um, we lose about 75% of the kids we raise in the church by the time they turn 18. 75% are fully involved in the church, disappear from the church at age 18. Well, that means 25% made it through that trial, right? 
And so about this 25%, uh, people have studied what was happening in their lives. Can we learn anything uh, about it? And here are a few things they, they learned about this 25% that stayed connected. They ate dinner with their families five out of seven nights every week. And that regular time of family time over around the dinner table. Uh, number two, uh, the kids served with their family in some kind of ministry. Like they did it together as a family. Number three, they had one spiritual experience in the home every week. This doesn't count taking them to church. Like at least once a week in the home, the family got together, they prayed together, or read the Bible together. Uh, number four, uh, kids were entrusted with ministry at an early age. Like churches need to get the littlest of kids involved and have them ministering and serving. And then number five, the 25 that survived, 25% had at least one other faith-focused person involved in their lives besides their parents. And this is why I would wish that, that, that every older member in our church would find one kid or one middle school student or one high school student in our church and just adopt them. Make sure you speak to them every Sunday. You go to their ball games or their plays. Take them out to lunch. Do something that lets that one student know that you love them and you're praying for them. Now, we all know it's a parent's responsibility by and large to, to train their children in the faith. But the church is meant to be that great support system that helps them to do that. And that is what our church is committed to do. So in closing, as my neighbor and I continue to talk as we did yard work, we had some more follow-up questions about our church related to the pandemic. And I answered him honestly. I talked about you. I gave him the straight truth about you. And he said, boy, that sounds like a really healthy church. Yeah, and I believe it is. I believe you are. And I'm blessed to be your minister here. Absolutely blessed. So many churches over these past few years fought and divided over things like Trump or Biden or mask or no mask. And, you know, each went their separate ways. I didn't have to deal with any of that one time. And I saw folks on both sides submitting to folks on the other sides. That's a sign of a healthy church. But we don't want to rest on that, right? Just the present. We want to build Jesus' church for the future as well as the present. Our group is going to come and lead us in the song of decision. If we can be a church that blesses you this morning with prayer or counsel, encouragement in some way, give us the privilege of ministering to you by meeting me forward and telling us how we can help as together we stand and sing. Nearer, still
Worcester has, uh, please be seated. Uh, Worcester Basin has come asking for prayers for his sister Porter. Um, she fell and broke her back. They're not sure if paralysis uh, is in the future, so this is the, a time of uh, trouble and great concern for Porter. And Worcester's wanting us to pray for her, and Worcester wants us to pray for him that he can uh, be a blessing to his sister. Uh, and honor Jesus Christ as, as he does that. So let's just pray for him right now. Lord God, would you bless Porter with all that she needs this hour? Would you comfort and soothe her heart and spirit? Give her assurance of mind and God healing of body. And would you, God, uh, work in her body and her soul? So that she knows that you were present with her and that you will never leave her. Would you bless Wister with words and attitudes and presence uh, that will be of great help to her. And just uh, calm this family and soothe them this hour with your grace and mercy. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Chuck's going to lead us in a closing prayer in a moment. You know, this is a new format, you know, is we're, we're kind of going as we go. And so, actually, we're at 1140. So, parents, at, after the closing prayer, you can go straight to the Fellowship Center uh, to wait for your students. Unless you're a parent of a two- and three-year-old, you can go to their hallway. Don't open the door or knock on it. When they're done, they will come out. We want them to get as much discipleship in Jesus as possible in their class. So, just hang out in their hallways. Thank you very much. Chuck, come and close us. As the lone shepherd here today, because Wes and, uh, is that really good? <laughs> Kevin, yeah, are traveling. I really appreciate your sheep behaving. Because if you just scattered, I'd have never got to round it up again. <laughs> I love to hear and to see the fellowship and the hugging and all that taking place now. We missed it. Amen. 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 All right. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we can share our lives together, our love for each other, our love for you. Father, we have several of our loved ones who are suffering and the sickness we ask father that you touch them with your presence ease their suffering father we just pray that you'll help us to be there maybe it's just our presence maybe it's just our love and help us ease those burdens we ask that you be with us as we depart and help us father to bring honor and glory to your name, to all that we come in contact with. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.